dāmas un kungi, labdien! Šodien mums ir īpašs viesis. Šīs dienas lekcija prezentācija būs angļu valodā, tādēļ es atļaušos turpināt angliski. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, guests, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the University of Latvia to this very special occasion, very special lecture, which will be given by one of one of leaders of civil aviation in uh, worldwide, I would say, uh, Tony uh, Tyler. His official position is uh, Director General and Chief Executive Officer of the organization, which is International Air Transport Association. I am not sure that everybody knows what this kind of what kind of organization this is. Uh, we have limited time. I will be mentioning only two uh, numbers to facts which probably will reflect immediately what kind of organization it is. Uh, this organization has as its members 240 airlines worldwide. Uh, it means, to my understanding, that almost every airline, every company in the world is a member of this organization. Um, companies are coming from 115 countries and it counts for 84% of global air traffic. So, means almost all the air traffic is there. Uh, if we are looking from financial uh, side, that uh, financial systems of this organization, uh, if I understand correctly, each year uh, processes more than 380 billion US dollars. Uh, you can compare it with the budget of our country and then you immediately will understand <laughs> scales. So, uh, I will not be continuing this way. I think that we should save time because uh, Mr. Tyler uh, will be flying out of Latvia very soon. And uh, let's join me uh, and welcome Mr. Tyler. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Rector. As, as Anch for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, what I would like to do before I start to speak is to um, introduce a short video, if I may, um, which is celebrating the, the 100 years of commercial aviation which we're celebrating this year in 2014. So if I could ask my colleague, uh, Raman, please to stay. We have come a long way in 100 years. In 1914, one route, one passenger and one ticket captivated imaginations, generated hope and laid the foundations for the modern miracle of flight. Today, more than 3 billion people and 50 million tons of cargo take to the air every year. Flying reunites loved ones, connects cultures, opens markets and expands minds. Flying can deliver that special ingredient for your favorite meal. It can help your neighborhood small business reach the world. And it can help you say thank you to a friend on the other side of the world. It makes possible diplomatic handshakes that promote peace and brings you to the long-awaited family reunion. The last hundred years have flown by. And this is only the start. The potential to change the world sustainably over the next hundred years is almost unlimited. A small world with a big future. So come and celebrate a hundred years of commercial flight that have revolutionized our world and join the conversation about how, together, we can make the next century even more momentous. The aviation sector contributes 0.8% to Latvian GDP, which rises to 2% of GDP when you factor in aviation-related tourism as well. It supports uh, almost 8,000 jobs and an additional 12,400 in, in tourism. Aviation is a significant contributor of taxes to the Exchequer and, of course, it provides incalculable benefits to the people of Latvia and the businesses that are based uh, here in the country. Latvian passenger air travel is set to grow upwards of 4.5% on average for the next few years. Cargo growth will be almost as much as that, an excellent performance. And this is significant because as Latvian trade diversifies and its economy produ produces more high value and low weight goods, the importance of air freight connectivity is going to increase. 
And in terms of air connectivity, by European standards, Latvia is well connected for its size. Only Ireland, Switzerland, Portugal and Spain are better connected by air. And Latvia is better connected than comparable economies like uh, Denmark and Norway. Riga International Airport offers 83 destinations and handles more passengers than Vilnius and Tallinn's airports combined. And given that Latvia was only relatively recently able to assert its independence, its integration into the global economy has been remarkable. Now, of course, Latvian history and, and culture go back hundreds of years, but I noticed that the modern history of Latvia essentially begins with its declaration of independence on the 18th of November, 1918. And that's interesting because it makes modern Latvia slightly younger than commercial aviation, which, as we were going to show you, I hope we'll show you, uh, commercial aviation was born on the 1st of January 1914 in Florida when a single-paying passenger was flown in an aircraft across Tampa Bay. And the entrepreneur who set up the St. Petersburg to Tampa airboat line, a gentleman called Percy Fansler, said at the inaugural flight, he said, what was impossible yesterday is an accomplishment of today, while tomorrow heralds the unbelievable. Now, he was very prophetic, but even Mr. Fansler couldn't have imagined the connected world that we live in today. Because from one route and one passenger in 1914, uh, the industry has grown to serve more than 3 billion passengers a year across 50,000 routes. So if aviation was a country, it would be the 21st largest in the world, ranked by GDP, larger than the pharmaceuticals, textiles, or automotive sectors. But more than that, aviation is a tremendous enabler of, aviation, of economic activity. One third of um, all global trade by value goes by air. That's about seven trillion US dollars. The smartphone in your pocket can only be built to an affordable price because of the global supply chain that aviation makes possible. And aviation is a multiplier of jobs. Directly, it employs nearly 9 million people around the world. But if you add in the indirect, the induced, and the tourism-related employment, um, aviation then supports 58 million jobs. 52% of tourists travel by air, making aviation essential for the $2 trillion global tourism market. So it's a big business, aviation, and it also helps other businesses to grow. But of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Aviation offers so much more. Commercial flight has made the world a smaller place. It's brought a greater understanding of our planet's incredible diversity of cultures, races, and religions. It's fostered the spread of education, of ideas, innovations, and it has been an undoubted force for good. Now, I know the events in Ukraine have deeply concerned the Latvian people, and I won't go into the historic and political reasons why. You know these far better than I do anyway. But I would like to comment on some of the practical work that we've undertaken in the aftermath of the terrible shooting down of MH17. And let me be very clear. MH17 was a civilian airliner crossing airspace at a height that had been declared safe. And it, its targeting by a ground-to-air missile, whether by accident or design, was a criminal act. And I hope the perpetrators are brought to justice. And what this unprecedented event has illustrated is that although aviation remains safe, there's a gap in the system that really needs to be addressed. And that's why it was important that the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, took the lead in formulating the response. Um, together with our airport and air navigation colleagues, IATA has joined an ICAO task force that's focused on finding a global, practical solution for flying across conflict zones. And better information sharing is the key, though we must recognize that this is an area with great political uh, sensitivity. Now, the industry is going to do all it can, but ultimately, it needs the governments of the world, through ICAO, to find a solution. And we also believe it's important to, work, to, to begin to work um, on a longer-term goal of better control of the manufacture and use and deployment of surface-to-air missiles.
and weapon, other weapons. And the vital importance of global aviation means that the people who are charged with the responsibility to provide aviation service and to regulate its performance have nothing less than a pivotal role in the well-being of everyone on Earth. It's incumbent on industry and on policymakers to work closely to ensure a strong, safe, secure and sustainable air transport system. Now, in just a few months' time, Latvia will have a vital role in exercising this responsibility because from January, Latvia will take on the presidency of the European Union. And this is a critical opportunity to influence the direction of the European Union and particularly to help to strengthen the air transport sector in the region. Now, Europe has an impressive air transport sector. The 200 plus airlines in the EU28 support 9.2 million European jobs and about $660, million, $660 billion I'm sorry, of Europe's GDP. And they connect a continent that accounts for 10% of the world's population, is the largest single economy on the planet, and which is home to amazing world heritage sites, cultural assets, and of course, superb academic institutions like this very one that we're in today. So how is it that Europe's airlines aren't more successful? Now, it's a fact that European airlines are financially the weakest if we look and compare the different regions of the world. And the difficulties that Air Baltic have found in finding new investment, despite the strong turnaround in the airline's recent performance, reflects the reality of this situation. Now, we expect European airlines to realize a post-tax net profit of $2.8 billion this year which is an average net profit margin of just 1.3%. Put another way, they will make about $3.23 per passenger, which is less than a third of the $11.09 a passenger that their counterparts in North America will be earning this year. Now, I believe that the reason for the poor financial record of European airlines is the competitive disadvantages that the European, European governments place in their way. The industry here is overtaxed, onerously regulated, and suffers from a chronically mismanaged air traffic management system, insufficient airport capacity, and overall costs for infrastructure that are too high. Now, let me elaborate a bit about those issues. First of all, on taxation. Well, the poster child for onerous taxation is the UK's air passenger duty. And alone, this tax collects $4.5 billion a year. But it's not the only one. Germany and France also have counterproductive passenger taxes. And in the last two months alone, IATA has worked with our partners to respond vigorously to aviation tax proposals in Portugal and Sweden. And this year, the total European tax bill for airlines and their passengers will reach nearly $40 billion. And to put that in perspective, that's more than double what is paid in the Asia Pacific region. And there's a stark contrast between Europe and much of Asia and the Middle East, where many governments there value aviation more for the long-term economic value that the industry makes possible than just for short-term tax receipts. And the remarkable performance of some of the Gulf carriers, for example, is inextricably linked with the vision of their governments to place aviation at their heart of their government's economic strategies. Airlines in the Gulf are provided with world-class infrastructure and a regulatory and fiscal framework that promotes rather than hinders aviation connectivity. Now, some European governments are coming to the conclusion that they can't take aviation for granted. And some now understand that aviation isn't just a passive cash cow, but it's a delicate goose that can lay golden eggs, and it needs to be looked after. The Irish government, for example, has removed its departure tax because of the economic damage that that tax was doing. And during its presidency, I do hope that Latvia will help focus European governments on the economic value that aviation can deliver, uh, rather than simply the taxes that can be squeezed out of it. Now, European regulation of the aviation industry 
generates several competitive disadvantages. The first one is that Europe is, t is developing a tendency to over-regulate, often even when global standards already exist. And this often comes with unintended consequences. And passenger rights is a good example. EU Regulation 261 seeks to protect passenger rights, but it has draconian measures that compete and conflict with some 60 other passenger rights regimes around the world. And from the passenger's perspective, all this protection is just a confusing mess. Now, airlines are committed to providing safe, comfortable, and high-quality services to their customers. IATA's members last year even adopted a resolution outlining a set of fair and consistent global best practices on passenger rights. And we're encouraging governments to do the same by working through ICAO. Because ICAO is the forum where governments agree global standards to support air transport. And that's why it's always been uh, the focal point of our approach to manage aviation's carbon footprint. The industry is asking governments to agree on a mandatory global uh, carbon offsetting scheme through ICAO, which we'll need to achieve our commitment to carbon neutral growth from 2020. And earlier this year, we had a reminder of how successful the ICAO process can be when governments agreed on revisions to the Tokyo Convention, which will modernize the rules for dealing with unruly passengers. Now, what does all this mean for the Latvian presidency? Well, I hope that Latvia will be a strong voice for aligning EU Regulation 261 to global principles on passenger rights and that it will encourage European governments to ratify the changes to the Tokyo Convention. And on top of that, we're counting on Latvia to be a strong supporter of the ICAO process to develop a global framework for market-based measures um, to manage the industry's carbon emissions. And there's also an urgent need to address the failures of, of what we call light-touch economic regulation of infrastructure providers. For example, earlier this year, the German air navigation service provider, DFS, announced that it was putting up its charges by $300 million a year from 2015. And this example shows why we need a counterbalance to the market power of many infrastructure providers here in Europe. Effective, independent regulators must apply well-established international norms to bring about fair charging regimes, regimes that will facilitate the enhanced connectivity that can drive further economic growth. And over the next few months, there's an opportunity within the European Union to take some concrete and meaningful action as the airports package is refined. And I'm pleased to see that Latvia is starting a consultation process to look at the economic regulation of airports. And I think this is a good sign that Latvia will be a strong voice in driving cost efficiencies uh, at the European level during its uh, period as the president. And lastly, I call upon Latvia to be a strong supporter of much needed infrastructure improvements. The problems are many. And by Eurocontrol's own estimation, so these are numbers from Eurocontrol, not from, not from IATA, there will be a 12% shortfall in Europe's airport capacity by 2035. And that's a major concern for Europe's economic growth. But the severity of European infrastructure constraints is evident in that there's an even higher priority issue delivering the single European sky, or what's known as SES. The costs of inadequate air traffic management to Europe are enormous. At least three, Euro, three, three billion euros for airlines and six billion euros for consumers in lost time and productivity every year. On top of that, of course, there's the environmental cost of some 7.8 million tons of unnecessary carbon emissions every year. So Europe needs the single European sky. But member states, and I'm afraid I have to include Latvia, are not delivering. They're pandering to local interests and sacrificing social and economic gains to the frustration of the European public. And I really can't put this too strongly. The failure to implement the single European sky is the biggest infrastructure issue that the aviation industry faces anywhere in the world. And the next few months are going to be critical 
in determining the adoption of what's called the CES 2 Plus package, which is something that Europe urgently needs. We must seize this opportunity to evolve European air navigation service monopolies into customer service and, and, and cost-effective members of the air transport value chain. And the most important contribution that Latvia could make to Europe's air transport sector over its six-month presidency is to push forward CES 2 Plus to completion, building on the work of the current Italian presidency. Now, over the last 100 years, commercial aviation has demonstrated its ability to be a catalyst for economic activity and a driver of prosperity. And Europe's air transport sector, including Latvia, is in desperate need of leadership to alleviate the tax burden, improve regulation based on global standards, and develop, develop infrastructure to enable uh, success. And we're counting on Minister Mattis to be a strong force for much needed progress and to help set the stage for aviation to make an even greater contribution to European development in its next century. As I said, we're celebrating in aviation, we're celebrating our century this year. And in four years' time, Latvia will be celebrating its century. And the last century has seen more change than almost the rest of human history put together. And perhaps the biggest change has been develop the development of what we can, in all truth, describe as the global village. And that's only been possible because of aviation. And Latvia's rapid integration into the global economy post its independence means that you in this country have a greater appreciation than most of the importance of that connectivity. A modern economy cannot survive and develop without the global connectivity that only aviation can deliver. Latvia is no exception to that, and looking on a broader scale, neither is Europe. So let's be under no illusions. Europe's aviation industry is struggling, but the position, of, of course, is, is nowhere near hopeless. The simple steps that I've outlined today, raising competitiveness through fiscal and regulatory reform, and prioritizing better infrastructure those are the things that are going to deliver improvements. And above all, it does need a change of mindset, placing aviation connectivity at the heart of the nation's economic strategy and at the heart of Europe's economic strategy. And Latvia now has an opportunity to push for that positive change. So for Europe's sake, and indeed the broader world's sake, I wish you every success in that endeavor. Thank you very much indeed. Do we have the, uh, and now we can watch the video. Okay, thank you. We have come a long way in a hundred years. In 1914, one route, one passenger, and one ticket captivated imaginations, generated hope, and laid the foundations for the modern miracle of flight. Today, more than three billion people and 50 million tons of cargo take to the air every year. Flying reunites loved ones, connects cultures, opens markets, and expands minds. Flying can deliver that special ingredient for your favorite meal. It can help your neighborhood small business reach the world. And it can help you say thank you to a friend on the other side of the world. It makes possible diplomatic handshakes that promote peace and brings you to the long-awaited family reunion. The last hundred years have flown by and this is only the start. The potential to change the world sustainably over the next hundred years is almost unlimited. A small world with a big future. So come and celebrate a hundred years of commercial flight that have revolutionized our world and join the conversation about how, together, we can make the next century even more momentous. And I recommend you visit our, our, the website, uh, flying100years.com, uh, and, and, and share your early memories of your first flight uh, uh, with us on that website. Thank you very much indeed for, for listening.
Mr. Tyler, thank you so much for such an interesting view from inside of the industry, what's happening in Europe and globally. Uh, do we have time for a couple of questions? Yes, indeed. Yes, sir. So, do we have questions? Uh, maybe I should start. <laughs> yes. uh, but I will uh, ask my question from the viewpoint from the ordinary customer. Uh, when we are flying in different routes, usually we are very happy about service, about efficiency, but still, if I am flying, for example, to San Francisco, Los, Los Angeles, it's still taking 10 hours. Do we have any uh, chance that the technologies will be developing, I don't know, supersonic jets, whatever, to make it uh, faster? Well, this is something that, um, of course, some 40 or 50 years ago was seen as a an important development that, that, that should be worked on and for a while there was the Concorde. Um, sadly the Concorde never made any money. Um, the, the problem is we're, we're up against some problems of, of, of physics and I'm not a physicist but um, breaking the, 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 the um, uh, sound barrier is a very expensive thing to do. Uh, getting aircraft to, the, to those, the, those speeds requires engines that are enormously powerful uh, and that means consuming huge quantities of, uh, of fuel. Um, the trade-off between speed and cost, um, when, you, when we're looking at uh, supersonic speed, has never made economic sense. Uh, it's possible that new technologies could, um, could change things. One day, who knows, we may even go into, um, into low, lower space uh, to travel very far and very fast. Um, but until we have some new very new technologies which don't exist at the moment, I'm afraid we're going to be flying subsonically. Um, but we can do a lot to speed up travel, um, in t in t both in the air and on the ground. Uh, in the air, you know, we fly too many zigzagging routes. Uh, we need to modernize air traffic management using, using available technology to make sure we are flying optimum routes. And we can also speed things up on the ground. When you, you mention a flight from, um, fr from San Francisco to, 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 to Europe, frankly, you, you, or, uh, and, uh, 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 and also traveling back the other way, you as a passenger spend far too much time um, queuing and going through inefficient security screening on the ground. And uh, we're working hard. IATA's pushing various initiatives to improve that. And then, particularly when you're flying in the other direction, uh, you spend far too much time queuing for immigration at the other end. And again, we're encouraging governments to invest in technology that will speed that up as well. And I must say, it, it, it infuriates me as an airline guy when I know how much technology goes into providing a non-stop flight, for example, from Hong Kong to Los Angeles, which is a fantastic technological achievement, you know, to fly for 14 or 15 hours really a quarter of the way around the world and you do it, let's say you manage that in 14 hours and then you spend two hours queuing to get, you know, that's, that's covered you know, something like um, 8,000 miles and then you spend two hours doing the last 50 meters. There's something very wrong and we need to speed up those parts of the process too. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, yes. Please. please use microphone. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for your interesting lecture. And I have a question regarding uh, not very maybe happy situation about Malaysian uh, MH37 flight, which has been lost this March. And can you comment somehow this? Certainly. Um, look, it, 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 it's a, an unprecedented event that a, that a large commercial airliner um, can simply disappear like this. Um, and I, can't, I cannot possibly speculate on what happened to it. But what I can do is say that we as an industry have, have come together determined to make sure it can never happen again. And IATA um, convened a task force in the days following the disappearance, once it was clear that it wasn't easily um, going to be found, to look at and, and determine best practices for how aircraft can be tracked better so that uh, they cannot simply disappear like this. That task force is still um, working, still um, doing, its, uh, doing its work, and will be reporting to ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, next month. 
and later on in the year they'll be following discussions with ICAO, um, be reporting to our board and we will be looking to come to conclusions before the end of the year uh, in what happens to make sure aircraft cannot um, disappear like this ever again. Now it will have to be a, a tailored um, set of procedures or protocols because the, the challenge is very different whether you're tracking an aircraft flying for two hours across heavily populated land. Um, it's a very different issue from tracking aircraft flying uh, perhaps uh, many thousands of miles from land over, over um, large oceans where radar is not in operation. Um, but we will, be, uh, we will be coming forward with proposals um, that can be adopted using current technology. Modern aircraft um, management technology exists that can, can, can play a very important role in making sure this doesn't happen again. Um, I wish I knew what had happened. Uh, I think we all wish that. But we, what we can do is make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? If it's not the case, probably we should thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.